show you how to do that as well. Um, reproducibility is a real key in translating this therapy. So when you isolate one stem cell one day and come back next year and isolate another stem cell using the same protocol, are those two populations the same? And for regulatory issues, you have to prove that they are the same. And so we've been working on that with a number of different molecular biology techniques. Um, cost effectiveness is also an issue going forward. IPS cells, as you heard from the first talk, um, can be generated, can be used to generate photoreceptors. It's really long and expensive to do that. Um, the reagents that are required to do the retinal protocol differentiation step is, are very expensive. And again, with human cells, it takes about half a year to generate photoreceptors. So with the cells that we're using here, because they're already committed to the retinal phenotype, it takes seven days in culture to differentiate the human cells into photoreceptors. And that's a big difference. And you don't need to require, it doesn't require any exogenous factors, just a good substrate. Okay, so there are lots of places, of course, to get self-renewing pluripotent cells. Again, we're going to hear about all of them today. I'm going to talk to you about tissue-specific cells isolated from the CNS, in this case, the retina. So this cartoon highlights a couple of the issues facing us when we're trying to transplant new cells into the retina. The real key is when to do it, not when from a point of view of disease progression is a whole other question. Let's go a step back and figure out when do you transplant the donor cells in the stage of differentiation. If you're playing with commitment versus plasticity. Early, early cells might be very plastic, but might not make the kind of cells you need. If you pre-differentiate them into mature photoreceptors, we already know they're not going to integrate and not going to make connections. So somewhere in the middle is the optimal. And we're trying to figure out what that is. The work from the London group, Robin Ali's group, would indicate that the stage that says post-mitotic photoreceptor precursors here is the ideal stage, at least for mouse-to-mouse -mouse transplants. Um, so we're isolating cells and growing them as lineage-restricted progenitors, but are, they're still proliferating. Okay? And the question is, do they still make photoreceptors? And I hope I convince you that they do still make photoreceptors after transplantation. So this is what the human retina looks like at the stage that we're isolating. This is about 16 weeks of gestation. The retina at this stage has some committed cells, some cones, early born cones out here, some early born ganglion cells here, but most of the retina is neuroblastic at this stage. And if you stain it for markers of, of, of pluripotent cells, or at least of proliferative cells, SOX2 here, and KI67, we see that there's abundant um, pluripotency and proliferation taking place, um, but very little commitment to specific cell types. Again, we see a few Early born cones expressing recovery, but no rods have been born yet at this stage. And we're not sure what this recovering staining here is in the ganglion cell layer, but we don't think they're photoreceptors. So what we've been doing is trying to characterize the phenotype of these cells using a bunch of different approaches. One of them is flow cytometry, looking for surface markers. And here we have different isolations and different passages. So these are two different isolations. We're calling them 86 and 89. And they're showing, at least for 86, passage 9 and passage 14. And looking at the expression of some of these interesting markers that we're, we're interested in, SOX2 is expressed by over 95% of these cells, and that maintains after passaging. Um, PAC6 is a little more variable. It's around 50%, but it does change a little bit. It just seems to be a little fluctuation, there's no consistency to it, but somewhere between 45 and 60 percent of the cells are SOX2 positive. CD73, a marker that's been used to isolate subpopulations of photoreceptor precursor cells, are expressed in high, high levels by these cells, regardless of passage. Interestingly, we don't see any CD133, typically a marker for neural stem cells, and these are neural stem cells from the eye. Um, so we don't see that, and that's interesting. We also don't see, for instance, A2B5, a marker for developing glial lineage. And so these cells are not very good at making Mueller cells or astrocytes. So one of the things that we've worked on is, again, how to grow these cells into enough cells to use, um, to characterize them and to transplant them. And so in the old days, typical incubator conditions, this is what happened. Senescence at about 45 days. 
not enough cells are generated. You can't continually isolate these cells. Um, so what we had to do is figure out a way to expand them. And the work of Marie Chetta in other stem cells has shown that <laughs> low oxygen, 3%, 5% oxygen, leads to increase in pluripotency and increase in proliferative capacity. And now the limits are off of these cells. We can now grow them for long periods of time um, without them changing or senescing, up to 20 passages, which gives us trillions and trillions of cells. This is the banking strategy that we have. So we have banked these cells, three different cell lines under GMP conditions uh, with seed banks and working banks. Um, this has all been done with a collaborator in Philadelphia, a WUXI laboratory outside of Philly. And they've been doing all these GMP isolations. So they use our technique to isolate these cells and do it under GMP conditions. So we have enough cells. That's not the problem. The question is, what do these cells become when you differentiate them? So we're looking at PCR, immunohistochemistry, and flow cytometry methods of, con of confirming whether these cells have the capacity to make photoreceptors or not. And we use an in-culture assay. I won't tell you much about. Um, I'll tell you nothing about it. It's a, it's a polymer substrate called polycaprolactone, coated with fibronectin, something magical about the stiffness or the Young's modulus, no relation to me, um, of this polymer substrate induces very rapid differentiation of these cells and other cell types of the neural lineage into whatever cells they're going to become. So can they make photoreceptors? They can. So this is showing an explant assay, and I think I'll make it. Um, grafted cells are green added to a retina, now stained for um, photoreceptor markers. This is rhodopsin. And what we're seeing here is that the outer edges of these cells um, are forming what look to be like outer segments. And I think I'll show you some images of these cells stained for ROM1, peripheral, and other markers of outer segments. But here they line up in the outer nuclear layer and start making rhodopsin. If we transplant them into a mouse, we can see that they also, here, here's an OCT image, really cool um, new OCT machine we have at the Institute. Um, you can see the bolus in the subretinal space. And then we go in and label these human cells for human mitochondrial markers and again, see them lining up in the outer nuclear layer where we want them to be. So they migrate to the right place um, and they also make photoreceptors. Here we're seeing again, rhodopsin staining. So all of the, this is a rhodopsin knockout animal. So this animal has no rhodopsin. That's why the outer nuclear layer is not stain positive. These orange cells are donor cells that are making rhodopsin and integrating in the outer nuclear layer. I want to tell you it's a real challenge to do human studies in mice recipients. Um, the cells don't survive very long. And some of our future work is going to um, make use of immunodeficient mouse strains that have retinal degenerative backgrounds. This has been made by a former student of mine, Bud Tucker. And there we can really study what these cells can become over time. Just another image of transplanted cells expressing rod markers after transplantation. We've done some work in RCS rats. These cells also rescue diseased photoreceptors in RCS rats. Not surprisingly, they make lots of growth factors. And they do it anatomically as well. In pig-to-pig -pig studies, we've seen that these cells can also make photoreceptors. So these are all, this is a bolus of cells in the subretinal space. These are all new photoreceptors sending synaptic processes <coughs> into the appropriate plexiform layers here. Okay, so just to summarize, the retinal progenitor cells that I've described to you can be isolated from embryonic retinal tissue, including humans. Uh, we can expand them into many trillions of cells in a dish. And like iPS cells, and the ES cells, they make rods and cones when differentiated, but unlike these cell types, we think they're very safe and unlikely pr to proliferate after a transplantation. Thanks very much. I just want to thank the uh, Hope for Vision group very much because they gave us um, $25,000 several years ago, and I think probably Betty Feeney had something to do with that. Um, which allowed us to do the first work in animals with the vectors that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, I'm at Florida Atlantic University, which is a state uh, university north of here. And um, we don't have things like lasers. And 
it was very important in the early days of testing our, our vectors to be able to use an animal model, and we used an animal model at that time, using lasers um, so that we would have a model for uh, CMV. But uh, what I'm going to talk about today is actually the model that we use for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so there are two diseases that are well known that have abnormal uh, angiogenesis in the adult. One is AMD, and the other one is diabetic retinopathy. And I'm going to tell you today about our results uh, in an animal model of diabetic retinopathy. So as I mentioned, um, I must say that you're going to be one of the, the best informed lay audience that I've ever spoken to. Um, so I'm going to go over it uh, without a lot of detail, and of course I do have slides with details that that's important too. Um, so in diabetic retinopathy, what happens, the hyperglycemia leads to vessel loss. And the vessel loss gives you an area of hypoxia <coughs> ischemia, and that causes neovascularization to occur in this adult eye. And of course we know that when you have adult angiogenesis, you end up with vessels that are very um, abnormal and they break easily and you end up with blood in the eye and eventually you end up with loss of vision, the photoreceptors degenerate. So this would be uh, what we normally see is uh, there is a blood vessel supply in the choroid and then there's some inner uh, vascular supply that's coming here from the central artery, the ophthalmic artery, and the inner retina is supplied in this region. But what happens in diabetic retinopathy is you have this area of hypoxia, and that eventually leads to this massive growth of blood vessels into the vitreous. You also end up with epiretinal membranes, and it's a very nasty, deleterious situation. So what we did in uh, trying to devise a gene therapy method was to try to optimize some of the situation that occurs in this uh, pathological state. So we were interested in who, which cells we would target. We thought it was important to include a promoter so we would target a cell type that would, could be turned on. And we wanted to use a rescue gene, so uh, we're, we chose to use endostatin, which has been shown in, by several other labs, to, um, stop the, to stop neovascularization that occurs in these animal models. And we wanted to be able to regulate the levels of production of our rescue gene. And we did that by using a hypoxia responsive element. So what our hope is, is that we will, our strategy is that we use something called an HRE. It's a set of genes that comes actually in the beginning, it came from the erythropoietin gene, which uh, causes the uh, cell to be able to sense changes in hypoxia. Uh, we add a few other uh, pieces of DNA to that. We use a cell-specific promoter. Then we have our gene of interest. And what happens is under normal conditions, if this vector gets into a cell, a silencer is being used because it's normal oxygen concentration. However, when hypoxia happens, HIF-1 binds to this hypoxia responsive element, and um, HIF-1 is hypoxia-inducible factor, and now what happens is we have our vector is turned on, and we have the production of the gene of interest, which in our case is endostatin, and that should lead to uh, the reduction in those abnormal vessels. So in order, in trying to decide what cell to use, we chose the Mueller cell because it extends from the region out in the region of the inner segments all the way to the inner limiting membrane. And again, those abnormal vessels are all down in this region here. So we thought a Mueller cell would be a great target to uh, produce that endostatin. And this is just a picture of a, a mouse retina with lots of uh, GFAP. GFAP is the promoter that we used. Um, it's found in abundance in Mueller cells. And um, our paper that we have on this project was first published. Um, and what it showed is that we could take this vector and we could take Mueller cells, we could get the vector into Mueller cells, 
and we could then put the Mueller cells in a normoxic condition and a hypoxia condition and show that we could turn on the vector and have GFP, the reporter gene, produced. We did a little bit of animal work uh, also during this study. Uh, the, this is primarily the work of our graduate student, Manus Biswal, at the time. Manus has now moved on and has moved up the state and is in Gainesville working with uh, Al Lewin. So, we wanted to, to test the vector that has the GFAP promoter, and we wanted to show that it could stop neovascularization in an animal model. So we used here um, an unregulated vector, if you will, and we also used our experimental vector, which has these hypoxia-responsive elements. So once this, if these two vectors get in the cell, this, this would be turned on all the time this would only be turned on in if there was hypoxia. So uh, we considered as a control, uh, the opposite eye had either PBS or it had just a naked capsid to be sure that um, our results were not due to something about the AAV and we used AAV2, single-stranded AAV2. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the mor morphological analysis and the biochemical analysis. We used as a, a model some a model that's probably very familiar to everybody in this audience, and that's the oxygen-induced retinopathy mouse model. You take young mice with their mother, and they're at P7. You put them in uh, high oxygen. You take them out at P12, and you leave them in room air, and you get this uh, huge growth in uh, vascular tufts in the region of the peripheral retina and you have a vascular um, degeneration in this area of the central retina. However, if you leave them long enough in room air, the vessels will actually recede. So the period of hypoxia is important and we decided to do our intravitreal injections here and then we did our data analysis at P17. So this is uh, what are how we analyze the data we make a whole mound after we do a vascular perfusion of peanut of um, excuse me most of my life was spent with peanut agglutinin but now i'm into <laughs> labeling blood vessels so this is actually tomato lectin which wasn't even around when i did the earlier lectin work anyway we uh, perfuse with our lectin and this would be the regulated vector the uh, retina from an animal that received the regulated vector. This is the other eye which has PBS and you can see that there's this huge growth of blood vessels and then this avascular area here. However, when we look at our experimental situation, we see that as in a normal situation, this is more vascularized here in the center <clears throat> And the periphery, we don't have these huge globs of vessels anymore, but we have a, a, a nice vascularization. So the summary of our morphological data is that we had a 90% reduction in the neovascular area in the periphery, and then a 90% of the a -vas a reduction in the avascular area. So that avascular area became um, vascularized. So I just am going to tell you the summary of our biochemical data. Uh, we were able to show that uh, there is normoxic uh, silencing. The regula regulated vector does not show endostatin expression in the retinas of mice in room air. We showed a hypoxic induction when we give our treatment by doing ELISA and Western blotting to show expression of our flag tagged endostatin, um, which is in the GFAP vector at P17 in those mice that were in this OIR model. And we also saw that our vector did have, um, uh, it had, we showed that it had exogen expression of endostatin by either the ve by either vector was able to reduce the VEGF level in this OIR model, mouse retina. So in conclusion, we specifically designed hypoxia-regulated glial cell-specific vectors that inhibited neovascularization in an animal model of diabetic retinopathy. We think the, the significance of our work is that we have a regulated switch for gene therapy. So we hope that our vector is turned on at the right time, in the right location, and at the right level. And this is what we think groundwork for gene therapy to treat neovascular disease in its initial phases. Um, what we're hoping to do now is to inject the vector to wait three or four months and see if we can turn it on
after the vector has been in the eye for a number of uh, months. And these are my collaborators uh, at FAU. And the other folks gave us pieces of DNA. Uh, GFAP promoter Keith Webster gave, gave us the initial HRE, and Douglas McCarthy gave us the single-stranded AAV. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, this morning, I'd like to talk about some optogenetic projects that we're doing in my lab uh, at Berkeley in collaboration with the Isakoff Lab. And we'll also talk a little about some other optogenetic approaches that Rich Kramer will talk about in a minute after me. So the idea in general for these optogenetic therapies is that this anatomical organization of the retina in the wild type state or the normal state is like this, where we have the layers of the retina photoreceptors to the inner retinal. But in most cases of advanced retinal diseases, what happens is that the mutations cause the photoreceptors to be lost, and in that situation, the only cells that respond to light have died. However, it looks like that these cells, the bipolar cells, and the downstream cells from that, the inner neurons of the ganglion cells, are still connected and probably still functional for very long periods of time, maybe years, after the patient has lost vision by the fact that they have no more rods and cones. So many different groups have decided to try to augment or design a genetically encoded way to restore vision to people that no longer have photoreceptors by adding an optical switch. And Rich will talk about one. Alan will talk about another one. Um, I'll talk about one in the other part of this talk. But generally, these switches can be targeted to different downstream signaling parts of the retina. So uh, Botan Raska and Jose Sahel are interested in adding uh, optical switches to survive in cone inner segments and patients that no longer have rods or cone outer segments. Other groups are using switches um, targeted to bipolar cells, and other groups are uh, targeting the most downstream, the retinal ganglion cells. And the thought is that the amount of restoration of function may be proportional to which target you use. So obviously the ones that are closest to the top, which are the cone photoreceptors, probably retain the most of the circuit, the center surrounding the edge detection. And then other patients who probably don't have surviving photoreceptors would get more restoration uh, from bipolar cells, but less than if they had um, cone as their restorated cell. And then finally, there's some patients that probably only have surviving ganglion cells. So there are many different optical switches that groups have decided to use. Um, the naturally occurring switches that have been used are channel rhodopsin and halo rhodopsin. Um, Rich will talk about engineered chemicals, AAQ and other derivatives of this that are azobenzene derivatives that modulate endogenous ion channels in the retina. Uh, we published uh, two years ago a uh, glutamate receptor that we genetically transferred to retinal ganglion cells. This is a summary slide that's prepared by the staff of the Foundation Fighting Blindness summarizing the results in the literature. And what I want to call your attention to is that all these different approaches, whether they're the glutamate receptor, channel rhodopsin, halo rhodopsin, or melanopsin, and regardless of which target you have, whether it's ganglion cells, uh, inner segments, or bipolar cells, all of them have a similar characteristic in the fact that they're significantly much less sensitive than normal wild-type human vision. So they all operate in the upper part of the cone range. It's probably easiest to see here. Um, they're operating in a light sensitivity that's about the uh, level of a bright June day or the Miami Beach today. And they don't adapt because I, all of these are one component, if you think, systems in which the light sensor and the ion channel are the same. So they have a very insensitive, relatively insensitive, and also this range is only up in the high end of the photopic range. One of the reasons we think that this is true is the fact that if you're moving the photo switch, whether it's channel rhodopsin or one of the other switches, to one of the downstream cells, whether it's bipolar cells or ganglion cells, this is the anatomy of the cell you're trying to replace, which are photoreceptors that have this huge antenna, if you will, of membrane of outer segment. And this is packed shoulder to shoulder with the light sensitive compound opsin. So in the case of these other cells, it's basically just the same as an inner segment, whether it's a bipolar or a ganglion cell. The surface area available for adding these photo switches is much, much less. So one of the thoughts of a student in the lab that's shared between Udi Isakoff's lab and mine, Benji Gaub, is to separate the light sensor from the ion channel. And that's what photoreceptors do, in that they have the light sensor as rhodopsin, then they have the G-protein cascade, then they finally have the ion channel in the plasma membrane. And so it may be well uh, that if you separate the light sensor 
from the effector that that gives you back some of the adaptation and perhaps some of the amplification that you see in photoreceptors that you don't see in these other approaches. So um, what Benji thought to do is to add a GPCR. In this case, there's a metabotropic glutamate receptor 6 that naturally occur in bipolar cells. And these receptors actually have this separation between the effector and the ion channel. So the idea is, can we hijack a G protein link cascade in a downstream cell, like a bipolar cell, and get back some of the amplification and the adaptation? So the idea is to design vectors that will transfer um, new switches to on bipolar cells and use that as a target for expression of GPCRs. And so one of the things we thought is the first example of that is to use rhodopsin. And so we designed an AAV vector with a promoter we got from Botan Raska and Connie Sepko. It's the GRIM-6 promoter. It's actually four copies of that um, driving a GPCR. Here's the expression of that. It's, um, very highly efficient for uh, transfecting on bipolar cells. And the functional assessment is in a multi-electrode array. So we lay the retina down and record from ganglion cells, but these are being driven by optical switches that are in on bipolar cells. So what, in the first set of experiments Benji was able to show is that rod opsin transferred to on bipolar cells drives uh, light sensitivity in ganglion cells. And here's a raster plot. Each one of these traces, here's the light pulses, each one of the, you see the activity goes way up, and this is about 30 different ganglion cells being recorded simultaneously, being driven by the on bipolar cells. Uh, here's another example, and what he's comparing here is wild type retina sensitivity compared to rhodopsin and channel rhodopsin in bipolar cells of RD10 mice that no longer have surviving photoreceptors. So, what he's able to show is that you get significantly more amplification. Here's the sensitivity of rhodopsin compared to either channel rhodopsin or the glutamate receptor expressed at the same level in the same cell. So it appears to be that there is some amplification and hopefully some adaptation by hijacking and separating uh, the, the light sensor from the effector. So in the context of human vision, what is this? Here's the uh, uh, measurements I showed you earlier, sunny day indirect light, this is channel rhodopsin in the on bipolar, the glutamate receptor. The measurement that Benji has made using rod opsin in the on bipolar is about weak office lighting. So it's about a hundredfold more sensitive by just separating the two into a cascade, if you will, than what's um, possible by using a one component expressed at the same level in the same cell. So in summary of this mouse work, we've identified at least one naturally occurring GPCR that couples to an endogenous ion channel in on bipolar cells. And we've made virus vectors that efficiently express that in on bipolar cells. And we think that they can reanimate the blind retina and enhance the sensitivity and maybe add some adaptation compared to other systems that have a single ion channel that's also the uh, sensor. So we're starting to move on to test this in larger animals. And this is a collaboration with William Beltran and Gus Aguirre at Penn. And so they've um, started to make animal models with uh, behavior that you can test only in dogs and you can't test in rodents. And they've looked at four different uh, dog models to test this. And what they've done is they've built obstacle courses that they can test the vision for optogenetic switches in dogs. And so uh, these are the protocols. I don't really have time to show them now. But this is the example of it. It's a large Y maze. And the dog enters the maze here. And then it has an optical task that it can see here. That's a stimulus, and it makes a decision whether to go right or left. And then finally, as an exit, which is sort of a doggy door. And what's surprising when you see that is the dogs just like really love to do the task. They run through the maze, they look at the target, they go right or left, they come out here, and then they run around the front again and ask to do it again. So, <laughs> so they've uh, built this optogenetic Y maze for testing the, whether or not it's the single component that Rich will talk about in a minute, AAQ or FENAC, or the genetically encoded components that I've talked about in the mouse work. And they're starting to test that in the dog animals. And so this is an example of how you do it. The dog comes to this decision point. Um, you test whether or not they can see the brightness and the acuity um, by projecting it on a screen. And then the dog makes a decision. One of the challenges that they found is that most of the dog models are really not that blind. So they have to um, induce light damage. The one that looks like the best example is the rhodopsin mutation, um, T4R, where they can induce light damage and then deliver the optogenetic tool. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about quickly is that we're also collaborating with Bill Merrigan and Dave Williams at Rochester to do these kinds of experiments in macaque. And this is the pattern that we see with the same vector I showed you earlier. However, in the macaque, what you see is because the interlimiting membrane is a barrier for the virus, so you inject in the vitreous, what you see is 
expression just around the macula. And the virus doesn't seem to have very good penetration outside the macula. However, this still is encouraging because the number of cells that you see in the macaque is hundreds of thousands. These are ganglion cells that are transfected. So that may still subserve useful vision. So what Rochester is trying to do is to make a macaque model of blindness, which is challenging because there isn't any genetically uh, available macaque model. So they're using a laser to ablate small areas of photoreceptors and then do psychophysics. So what they'll do is they'll test the cortical recordings um, by driving the system with the photoreceptors, then ablate the photoreceptors, and then drive the system either with vectors expressing the photoswitch in the on bipolar cells or in the ganglion cells, and then see how the cortex responds in the same animal um, compared to driving it downstream from bipolar cells from driving it in photoreceptors. So um, they're getting to the point where they have a macaque model where they can do psychophysics and they can do that with optical switches and they can test the difference between photoreceptor driven vision and downstream uh, driven vision, whether it's from bipolars or ganglion cells. Uh, I'd like to stop there and thank all the people that do the lab work, uh, grad students and postdocs in my lab, particularly this is Benji Galb's experiment um, in collaboration with Denise Salcara and Natalia Caporali. Um, the <laughs> dog work, as I said, is done with Gus and Bill um, and Pan, Dave Schaefer helped us design the virus vectors, and the guys in Rochester um, designed the macaque work. Thank you very much. We're narrowing in on sort of a, a, a one, one vector fits all cone applications, as you'll see. Okay, so first question, why target cones? Well, this audience, I don't need to, to describe that, but if you knew nothing about cones, but you saw the the, uh, the vasculature, the retinal vasculature uh, of a primate, you would, you would say, well, there's something funny going on in the middle. And that's the avascular region. Is this not on? That's the avascular region uh, that is, is, is over the cones and over the foveal cones. And of course, it's avascular, so you have the highest uh, uh, acuity uh, in the foveal cones, a reason for studying cones. Uh, and uh, this just uh, is a little bit better uh, anatomical view of the retina uh, here, human retina. And you can see that if you look down here, the a plot of cone density versus rod density right in the middle, right in the foveola, there's, is the highest cone density. And that corresponds to, to this region here in, in his, the histological section. So this is the region that we're really trying to target because it's responsible for our highest acuity vision, color vision, um, face recognition reading. Okay, what cone diseases uh, are, are important to, to think about treatment for? Uh, the criteria are really pretty obvious again. We want a, a gene uh, that targets foveal cones. The genetics needs to be well established. It should have a serious human phenotype as it should have a blinding phenotype. We'll talk about one phenotype in cones that isn't a serious disease, but there's a reason for that. And the animal models uh, for that specific cone disease need to mimic as, as much as they can the human disease. And obviously there needs to be a clear clinical endpoint if, if you really want to get into a clinical trial with cone targeted gene therapy. Um, so let's look at the genes that might be involved. Uh, uh, this is, of course, a cartoon of phototransduction. And what I want to do is highlight uh, the cone genes that can cause foveal, foveal disease. Uh, Oops, there are three uh, that cause achromatopsia. Achromatopsia is a loss of all cone function. And it's a serious uh, blinding disease. Uh, patients basically have, have no central acuity, uh, see with their, with their extrafoveal photoreceptors, uh, rods. Uh, and those genes include uh, a minor form of achromatopsia, the alpha subunit uh, uh, of the of transducin, GNAT2 gene, and the two major forms of achromatopsia, the the A3 and the B3 subunits of the cation channel, that's sort of the final step in, in uh, hyperpolarization after photon absorption. So there's three genes there, and uh, there's, there's two more, the red and green opsin genes. Uh, if one of them is lost, you can, it will lead to excellent color blindness, red or green, which is the, which is the non-serious uh, uh, disease, cone disease, and then a much more serious disease, blue cone monochromacy, where both red and green opsins are lost, and so you really still, have, again, have no foveal function because there's no blue cones in the fovea. So this is uh, maybe not quite as serious as achromatopsia, but it really falls into that class as well. So uh, just a, a bit about delivering the vectors. Uh, uh, at least uh, up until a year or so ago, it, it was thought that we had to go subretinal. 
uh, with your viral vector. And in the, in the case of anything that's not a primate, the cones are kind of uh, spaced out amongst the rods. And so a subretinal vector needs to deliver uh, its, its payload uh, uh, to the cones under this circumstance. Um, so we're going to have an AAV serotype, and an AAV5 serotype, as we have found quite a few years ago now, is very efficient at transducing rods and cones. Uh, we need a cone-specific promoter, and then we'll have a specific cone cDNA for that, for that disease that we're trying to treat. Uh, for most of what I'll say, almost all of it, uh, we're going to be using a 